welcome to The Pilates Show, where we explore creative and innovative Pilates tips and techniques to help deepen the skill level of the movement educator while having fun. I'm your host, Casey Marie Hertz, and today we're gonna to be talking about interesting anatomy. I wanted to highlight a, a really interesting, different way to, to look at the body and how it's um, organized. Um, and so that's why I brought out our nice little skeleton here. So we can start to look at this area of the front of the torso and how very similar it is to actually the back of the pelvis and the glutes. So if you look in your anatomy book and you look at the musculature um, and the bony structure of the pelvis, we have this nice mobile sacrum that moves on the iliums. And then you have big glute muscles that feed into and out of this area into the leg. Now what we know a lot about and we talk a lot about in Pilates is trying to get some differentiation of movement between the femur and the pelvis, right? We want it to work integrated, and we also want to work it uh, independently. And a lot of times, and for a lot of people, the glutes are an area of innate tightness. There's gripping there that inhibits all sorts of ranges of motion in through the leg and the pelvis. Um, and it really does, the tightness in the glutes and hips really does inform the femurs of where it's gonna be in the socket. So we do tons and tons and have tons of videos on release work to help to get this area to open up. Now that's all well and good, especially to get the sacrum to start having its nutation and counter nutation um, in our innate breathing patterns, right? It's great to really pay attention to that for lower body health, but the body is really amazing and it has repetitive systems and it has uh, repetitive structures. So I wanna then highlight how connected the sacrum and the glutes are to the front of the body at the torso, uh, that is that, that sternum and the manubrium and then the pecs. So the sternum and the manubrium, its shape, although thinner and smaller, is much like that shape of the sacrum. And notice that you know, the body is built on diagonals and spirals, and here, between these two areas, is a very important diagonal tension spiral. Now, what this does, these two shield-like bones, this houses your breath capacity and your movement capacity in through this whole area. So not only do these areas need to be strong, which as you saw, glutes, really important, very strong musculature. And if you think about it, the pecs that go into and out of this area, it's much like the same fibrous tissue down here, very strong. But these areas also need to be supple enough to be able to do all sorts of subtle movements. If you think about you know, breathing on the ribs, every time you inhale and exhale, the, the ribs are supposed to roll on the sternum and the manubrium. Now, a lot of people think that, or um, you know, if you just look at this, it looks like this is one big bone. Actually, right here, there's this notch. This is actually a joint, and it's supposed to move much like a, a drawbridge with every inhale and exhale to create more movement, more breath capacity so that we can open up and start breathing into the lower lobes of the lungs where more oxygen exchange occurs. Now, if you're very, very tight in through the pec area, which is here, not only does it do wonky things to the arms and shoulder girdle, it really does compress the rib cage from the front, disengaging this maneuverial movement um, from occurring for a, a really nice drop down of the diaphragm into the viscera that live here. Now, why is that important? We need to have this easy flow of the diaphragm to drop down, massage the internal organs, which also then gives a lot of innate 
uh, stability to the lumbar spine. That changing, um, that interabdominal pressure is actually a great stabilizing force for the front of the low back. So that preparatory inhale to really get that full lung capacity, not only does that, but it drops the diaphragm down, creating more pressure from the organs against the spine, giving it stability. Then the exhale, the sacrum goes into the body a little bit more and helps our core activation at the front and back of the spine. So for all of these things to happen with ease, without a whole bunch of cueing, we need to have the gear works of the mobility of the sacrum on the iliums, but also the mobility of the sternum and manubrium to create space for that inhale and exhale. Now, again, I wanna go back to that idea. You have large scale muscles like the pecs and the glutes that can hold those articulations hostage. And so we need to have very quick and easy ways to help our clients get that more innate birthright breath patterning that helps to articulate all the joints in the correct way so that they can truly start to embody what, what that uh, strength in breath means. So I'm gonna use this Cadillac as a mat and first things first, as we talk about often at Fusion, is that we're gonna have to do a little bit of work to release the tension from the glutes and the pecs before we can get the mobilization of the bones. So you, there's tons of information of this on our website. You can do an easy piriformis release with the ball underneath the glute and some nice leg articulations here, working on trying to get that tissue to open up. And you can also do just some easy pec release with the ball. You can do it up against the wall or laying prone on a bigger tennis ball. But what you wanna try to do is get into all of the tissue that's impeding the sacrum and then the tissue that's impeding the movement of your sternum and your manubrium on your inhale and exhale. So once you have opened those up, you can use a few different tools to help you out. Now, first thing is, is that I would want to get the sacrum to be able to float a little bit, to have as much movement as possible. So I have two hand towels that I've rolled up into little burritos, and I can lift the pelvis up and place them right underneath my each glute cheek, so they're right here underneath me, so that my sacrum can float really easily and have as much movement as possible. I just wanna show you, if you do have the Smart Spine products at home, you can use the arch tubbies, one underneath each glute cheek, nice and warmed would be great too. So once the pelvis is propped in this capacity, what you do is you have freedom of space for the sacrum to do on the inhale, the base of the sacrum drops down, and on the exhale, the base of the sacrum goes up and into the body. When you're laying flat on a mat, a lot of times that actually inhibits that natural motion. So for even for your clients that have a really hard time with their sacrums and SI joints, you can prop them in this way and it can take a lot of pressure off of the back. Now, I'm gonna use this smart spine globe, but you can also just use your hands here. So I'm gonna take this globe and place it right at the level of my sternum. And so on the inhale, I'm gonna drag this globe down into my sternum and towards my sacrum. And then on the exhale, I'm gonna allow the body to rebound. And so again, on the inhale, I draw this down and towards the sacrum. And on the exhale, I release everything to its natural place. Now what this is doing, this down and drag into the sternum, is it's actually opening up the back channels of my rib cage and spine 
finding lots and lots of space and grounding in that T8 area that we're always trying to find for our neutral spine and pelvis. I'm on a nice smart spine pillow because that's gonna further help direct the back of the rib cage into that motion. This is a nice way to get that posterior lateral breath that we're always looking for in Pilates, especially for maximum oxygen exchange for every inhale and exhale that we take. Now, a lot of people will wanna inhale up into the chest. This action, and I'll show you how to do it with your hands and not the smart spine, right? This action of dragging the tissue down this way really does open up this whole area that really needs to start to expand in most of our clients. Again, this is gonna pair with that beautiful, innate sacral movement. So if this is my sacrum, right? So when I inhale, I drag my sternum down to the sacrum. The sacrum's doing this. And then exhale, they move a little bit in opposition. So they're constantly moving on the ocean of the breath, finding that elongation of the spine. And this is how breath is your most powerful chiropractor in your body. This question comes in from Jolie on Facebook, and this question's about hammer toes. How do you deal with them? Is there any way, um, any exercises or release work that you can do to help mitigate them? And what do you do in positions like plank to help them ground in through their toes? So first things first, let's just kind of look at what hammer toes are um, so that that will really be a big place of, of answer for that. So if we think about what a hammer toe is, I'm gonna use my finger, it's much easier, right? So that's when the, the top of the toe meets the floor and the neck of the toe is off the floor and that a lot of times you'll see a big pronounced knuckle at the top of the foot. So the way that I look at that is that the bottom of the toe, very, very tight, as well as the top of the foot, say right here, um, will get very, very tight. So this is what we're gonna do. First is that we have to release the tissue to try to get some more opening there. So I'm gonna use our handy dandy green spiky ball. And I'm gonna start with rolling out the tops of my feet and toes. Now, this can be really, really tender tissue. There's not a whole lot of adipose tissue, muscular tissue to, to protect the top of the foot. So be gentle at first, but this can be one of those things where your where clients go, oh my gosh, yow, yow, yow. This is, this is tough, but very, very important because again, we have to get into this area of the foot to get it to open up. Now, remembering that it's not just a toe issue, these hammer toes, that it's a whole foot issue, it would be good to roll out the whole top of the foot, even the front of the ankle side of the leg. So lots and lots of work every day there. Now, the other piece of the pie with hammer toe is what's happening underneath. So what I do, and you can have people do the standing or seated, is start to roll and get those little spikes underneath the neck of the toes and even get the ball of the foot and toes down and try to stretch and open up that tissue. Again, people are going to give you all sorts of crazy looks when they do this because this is more tender than you could ever think about, but it's because these little free agents of the foot, the toes, right? They like, they have their own unique little patterns that they go into and they're not always healthful or helpful. So another thing that you can do is place this little green spiky ball between the big toe and second toe and do little squeeze and release. These are nice toe exercises that elongate that tight part of the toe while still strengthening it. And then you would go and place the middle three toes on top of the ball. 
pressing in and out. And then the ever troublesome fourth and fifth toe. And for me, I gotta kinda get my pinky on there. And then try to do that same press and activation. Seated is a good place to start with people because they don't have their full body weight onto it, but you can absolutely um, get people and do the standing upright um, when they're ready for it or right off the bat if they have a little bit less of foot issues. So those are really nice rehab oriented things that you can do to really help people with hammer toes. Now, your towels in your studio, hopefully you have a, a set or or a few sets of these hand towels. We use them all the time. They're so great for so many different things. So what I do for people that have large scale hammer toe issues is depending on how severe it is, I bring the floor to them. So for the interest of being simple, what I would do say if this was a foot bar or a jump board, I could bring this towel underneath the toes right where they want to pop up and then have and cue footwork with the toes pressing down into the towel but because there's a little bump it kind of brings the floor to them so it's a little bit less of a place to have to go to so that you don't have to create so much gripping to try to get that nice grounding there you can do the same types of things in say plank on the reformer you um you might need a few of them, and of course you'd want to back them with maybe some non-slide um, tissue, um, excuse me, non-slide um, matting around it so it doesn't go anywhere, but you can put these up against the shoulder rest so that they have a place to put their toes into so that they can get that pressure and that grounding in those vital places. And a lot of people think, oh, it's no big deal. Why am I you know, worrying about toes? But we have to remember that our connective tissue skeleton is completely integrated from the tips of our toes to the crown of our head. And so when you start to knock on the door of areas that people don't go to very often, it really does create a different sense of organization, a different sense of strength and communication in their exercises. So I love this question because sometimes it's these little nuances that really get people to move very, very differently. That's it for today. If you have any questions that you wanna see answered on an upcoming episode, you can comment below on Facebook, Twitter, or our forum. Thanks so much for watching and never stop learning.